Good evening. I'd like to call to order the Board of Education Special Board Meeting on Wednesday, June 7, 2023. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Approval of the revised agenda. I have a motion to move to June 14th, one of the items on there, which is a recognition for Jenna um, as our board liaison, because she's not here tonight, so we'd like to recognize her at the next meeting. Other than that change, I'd like to call for a motion to approve the revised agenda with that one edit. Motion. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Superintendent's tenure recommendations. Oh, sorry. Com Commendations are next. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first of two very exciting meetings where we get to recognize a lot of amazing individuals. First up on our agenda is the recognition of the 2023 PTA Reflections, and to assist with that is Ms. Bernie Vega, the PTA Council President. Hi. National PTA has a long-standing commitment to arts and education. The Reflections program provides opportunities for recognition and access to the arts which boosts student confidence and success in the arts and in life. Each year, over 300,000 students in pre-K through grade 12 create original works of art in response to a student-selected theme. This 50-year-old this program helps them explore their own thoughts, feelings, and ideas develop artistic literacy, increase confidence, and find the love for learning that will help them become more successful in school and in life. Students participate in the appropriate division for their grade, primary, pre-K, grade eight, grade two, intermediate, grades three to five, middle school, high school, and alternatively assessed special artists. Students submit their completed work of art in one or all of the available arts category. Dance dance choreography, film production, literature, music composition, photography, and visual arts. <laughs> this year, there was a total of 82 entries from Monroe Woodbury. The highest number of entries were from North Maine. The Monroe Woodbury PTA Council wishes to recognize Ashley Torres, North Maine PTA President, Assistant Principal Roger Davis, and Principal Joe Cotto for engaging the faculty at North Maine in creating excitement under, around the Reflections program by strategically sending the bilingual flyers home while they had the students wrap up Red Ribbon Week. Thank you for being intentional, and the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> so this year, we also had support from our new relations, Re Reflections Chair, Ancha Salisbury, who showed up with a smile and welcoming demeanor every time a new task was at hand. Thank you, Ms. Salisbury, for all your work and being so wonderful in taking on the task that impacts artists in Monroe Woodbury. And the winners are as follows. For the high school, in photography, Yuvraj Shandiak. Harrison Aaron, for photography. For literature, Yuvras Shandiak again. Okay. Gets to. Is that too low? Yeah, yeah, okay. Got it. For the middle school, dance choreography, Gianna Enriquez. For literature, Anushka Shandiak and, Ruber, and Ruby Eberly. <laughs> For 
for visual arts, Anushka Shandiak. Again. <laughs> Elisa Lee Lin. Avery Chiricella. Ethan Chiricella. For music composition, Anushka Shandiak. She's over there again. Photography, Anushka Shandiak and Matthew Lavagat. In film production, Anushka Shandiak and Emilio Perez. For Central Valley, in film production, Intermediate, Willa Salisbury. For photography, Intermediate, Jivat Sethi and Frida Salisbury. For music composition, intermediate, Rachel Lily Perez. For visual arts, primary, Aiden Cordero. For literature, intermediate, Juliana Ferrara. Jayanne Flournoy. For Visual Arts Intermediate, Lincoln Pierce. Madison Campfoy. And Anna Jacob. Photography, Andy Pierce. And special artist, Tyler Kempfoy. Hold on, we have one more. For North Maine, Visual Arts, Olive Pilla. <laughs> to 
Toby Lang. Oh, there she is. Isaiah Quijada. Mackenzie Reynolds. Joel Dunn. Victoria Cartmill. Matilda Pilla. Charlotte Butler. Luna Rodriguez. Danica Levinson. For literature, Lyra Fazikas. In photography, Hazel Ferrara. And Abigail Estrella. We move on to Pine Tree for film production, Elisa Lee Lin. <laughs> Lucius Flores Lasosi. <laughs> for visual arts, Jonathan D'Ambroso. <laughs> and Samir Malik. For music composition, Elisa Lee Lin. And for literature, Liam Flores Lasosi. And for Sapphire Visual Arts, Aliyah Malik and Jacob Habib. For Smith Clove, we have Ayan Muhammad. Thank you. 
Lee Wan No. And Olivia Cordero. And uh, these folks moved on to New York State in a Film Production Merit Award, Middle School, Emilio Perez. Pine Tree, Elisa Lee Lin. Pine Tree, Lucius Flores Lasosi. The Music Composi Composition and Merit Award, Central Valley, Lily Perez. Pine Tree, Elisa Lee Lin. And Visual Arts, the Merit Award, Central Valley, Tyler Kempfoy. North Main, Charlotte Butler. <laughs> Literature Merit Award in the middle school, Anushka Shandiak. <laughs> Ruby Eberly from the middle school. North Main, Lyra Fazikas. <laughs> Pine Tree, Liam Flores Lasosi. And for photography, the Merit Award is Central Valley, Frida Salisbury. Central Valley, Jeevit Sethi. Central Valley, Andy Pierce. And the middle school, Matthew Lavigat. Thing. I think so. PTA presidents are next. PTA presidents. Let's give these kids another round of applause. <clears throat> I'd like to begin with a quote. Small acts, when multiplied by millions of people, can transform the world. The following recipients are a wonderful example of people who believe in service to others and help to make our district a better place. They are members of the Monroe Woodbury PTA whose mission is to make every child's potential a reality 
by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. I would like to commend the following people. Our PTA Council, Bernie Vega, President. <laughs> Ashley Torres, Secretary. <laughs> Lori Leonardo, Treasurer. <laughs> Our SEPTA Co-President, Bernie Vega. <laughs> High School President, Alicia Pavagliano. Middle School President Angie Lavagat, Central Valley President Brianne Chase, North Main President Ashley Torres, Pine Tree Elementary President who could not be here, Andre, uh, Andrea Abrignani, Sapphire uh, President Lori Leonardo, and Smith Clove President Jillian O'Connell. Thank you, ladies. Yes. Don't go too far. <laughs> In the spirit of service, our next award is the Community Connection Award. The Community Connection Awards were created many years ago by our District Leadership Committee to recognize an individual or organization that exemplifies the spirit of the Monroe Bay School District through community-based activities and service to the school district. The awards are given individually by each of our schools as well as by the PTA Council. I'm very proud to recognize the following community members for their continued support of the Monroe Bay School District and most importantly to our students. To start us off this evening, I'd like to call up the principal of Sapphire, Ms. Caitlin Caldwell. Thank you, Dr. Hassler. Good evening, trustees of the Board of Education, Superintendent Rodriguez, members of our cabinet, and all those who are celebrating commendations and the other awards this evening. As Dr. Hassler said, my name is Caitlin Caldwell. I'm the principal at Sapphire Elementary School. On behalf of Sapphire, it is my great honor to thank our Community Connection Award designee, community member Raina Dameron. During the summer months, Raina reached out to offer support to the Sapphire community as the school year began. She worked with members of her neighborhood to assemble many school supplies, new backpacks, and lunch boxes for our students. As a result, we were able to package supplies in advance and have them prepared for students during orientation and on the first day of school. This made the first day wonderful for our students, both those who are returning to us and many for whom are starting their journey as MW students. They were all thrilled. Sometimes there's nothing better, even when you're an adult, than a fresh set of school supplies. This act of generosity and service allowed us to ensure the warm, welcoming, and smooth start to the school year. It is truly an honor to demonstrate our gratitude to community member Raina Dameron with the Community Connections Award from Sapphire. Thank you for your support and kindness that you've shown.
And next up is the principal of Smith Clove, Nicole Cook. And I think I saw and Shana Markevich as well. <laughs> Good evening, and I am very happy to welcome Mr. Dominic Gonzalez to the stage. He is dedicated to giving back to the Monroe Woodbury community. As a 2005 MW alumni, he strives to show students that through hard work and commitment to a goal, you can serve your com community and reach the highest standards. Officer Gonzalez is also committed to enhancing relationships within the community by dedicating time and efforts to outreach within the school district. He has facilitated opportunities for students to interact with members of the Town of Woodbury Police Department by organizing a school-wide visit where the students were able to experience the importance and value of canine units in helping the department keep the community safe. They love the canines. He also participated in read aloud opportunities in small groups and assemblies. He read books to students in the building. He offered opportunities for students to view, sit in, touch, and ask questions about a variety of vehicles that the police department uses. His commitment to maintaining connectedness within the community under a belief in true collective efficacy is valued and appreciated, and we are extremely fortunate to have a partner in Officer Gonzalez. And up next from Central Valley is Dr. Arthur Principal and Mr. Barone, the Assistant Principal. Good evening. On behalf of our Central Valley Elementary community, I am honored to recognize Father Ryder and Mr. Spagna on behalf of St. Patrick's Church in Highland Mills. For many years, Father Ryder and Mr. Spagna, one of the head coordinators for the Angel Tree Program, have partnered with parishioners to provide clothing and pajamas to Monroe Woodbury students. To ensure our students throughout Monroe Woodbury felt special, the items were wrapped and hand-delivered to our school during the holiday season. The joy students displayed in receiving special holiday gifts and their sharing their new favorite outfits or pajamas that they received is priceless. We thank Father Ryder and Mr. Spagna, as well as all of the par parishioners at St. Patrick's Church for their continued generosity in supporting our students with dignity, as well as in a manner that brings them joy and pride with the gifts received. Thank you very much. And up next from North Main, Mr. Cotto, the principal, and Mr. Davis, the assistant principal. Thank you, Dr. Hessler. On behalf of the North Main community, we'd like to recognize Chief Guzman of the Monroe Village Police Department. Chief Guzman has taken on the role of the police chief and the community liaison between the police and North Main. He has supported our school resource officer program to its fullest potential. Through the guidance of Officer Mahoney, our SRO, Chief Guzman continually dedicates the resources necessarily to facilitate a fluid working relationship between school and police. Each and every time we implement a North Main lockdown drill, Chief Guzman coordinates with Officer Mahoney to have officers on site 
at North Main and help us implement the drill along with Monroe Woodbury personnel. When North Main staff participated in a program called One Book, One School, we were looking for people connected to our community and school to read aloud for our students. Chief Guzman did not hesitate to volunteer to be video recorded reading several chapters of the book in Spanish. The kids were so excited to hear and see him and listen to him read to them. Not only has our school resource officer, Officer Mahoney, become an integral part of our North Main family, but Chief Guzman has made it a priority to become involved in our school community as well as bring the rest of his department along with him. The village of Monroe Police Department, through Chief Guzman's leadership and example, are truly connected to our North Main community. Thank you very much, Chief Guzman. And next up, representing Pine Tree Elementary, is the principal, Mr. Judis, and the assistant principal, Mr. Martin. All right, thank you, Dr. Hassler. Welcome, everybody. Um, on behalf of the Pine Tree BLC, uh, we are proud to present Marilyn Malone with the Community Connection Award for this year. She works for the Orange County Water Authority, based out of Goshen. Her efforts toward teaching students of all grades about conservation started back in 1994 at Monroe Woodbury with Smith Clove with the then principal Gail Caton Camp. Since 1994, Marilyn has visited close to every school district in Orange County, working with elementary students, teaching them about conservation education, and secondary students, teaching them about the estuary program physically at the Hudson River. She embodies the phrase that science is a verb. Her hands-on and kinesthetic activities, which she created, help make learning fun and science exciting for all students of all ages. She recently helped create a website to further share her excitement for learning. Over the years, she has worked in all seven Monroe Woodbury schools and with many teachers whom she considers friends. This Community Connection Award is extra special because after our BLC agreed on her being our nominee, we found out that she was retiring this year and moving to Tennessee to start her new chapter in her life with her family. So on behalf of the Pine Tree BLC, we especially, especially our third grade team who have worked with her throughout the years, uh, we'd like to congratulate Marilyn for her years of service and we proudly recognize her as our Community Connection Award recipient, Marilyn. And up next, representing the middle school, is the principal, Mr. Berger. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Monroe Woodbury Middle School, we, it is my, my honor and privilege to recognize Mrs. Noelle Larson as this year's recipient of our Community Connection Award. 
Mrs. Larson has volunteered to serve and work with over 160 of our middle school drama club students this year. Her selfless service to our students and our school community uh, has lent herself to provide individualized and small group vocal training, lessons of vocal pedagogy. She's consulted with our student-run stage management and she has provided the club with countless hours of support, always with professionalism and a student-first approach to the performing arts. Mrs. Larson is a, an extremely talented uh, industry professional with voice students that star in shows ranging from Netflix to Broadway, uh, and we're so appreciative and thankful that she was able to share her talents and expertise with, with our students in the middle school. I'm sure I speak on their behalf to say that we're extremely thankful for your dedication and your hard work with our students. I'm sure that they have learned and, growed, uh, and grew from you uh, working with you. So we are very thankful. Uh, and with that, I'd like to welcome Mrs. Larson up to the stage. And next up is Elisa Soto, who's the principal of the high school. Thank you, Dr. Hassler. It is my pleasure to nominate Ms. Caitlin Perone for the Community Connection Award and express our deepest gratitude for her outstanding support and dedication to our, house, our high school students. Unfortunately, uh, Ms. Perone cannot be here this evening. My understanding is that we have Ms. LeMay, who is here on her behalf, but I'd like to share a few words about Ms. Perone. Mrs. Perone's selfless efforts in providing our students with clothing and footwear have made a significant impact on their lives and their overall confidence. Ms. Perone recognizes that some students may face challenges that extend beyond the classroom, including financial constraints and limited access to essential resources. Mrs. Perone's involvement in addressing these challenges by providing clothing and footwear has been truly remarkable. By offering support in this fundamental area, she helps our students feel comfortable and confident in their daily lives. Her generosity has not only equipped them with the necessary clothing and footwear, but has also alleviated the stress and anxiety they may have experienced due to these circumstances. Her actions have undoubtedly boosted their self-esteem. We are incredibly grateful for Mrs. Perone's commitment to our students' well-being. Her acts of kindness exemplify the spirit of unity and compassion that we strive to instill in our students, and we are fortunate to have her as an essential member of our community. On behalf of Monroe Woodbury High School, I would like to recognize Mrs. Perone's invaluable support by presenting her, presenting her with a certificate of appreciation. This certificate serves as a token of our gratitude and symbolizes the profound impact she has made in the lives of our students. Thank you. And finally, representing our PTA Council, Ashley Torres, the Secretary, and Lori Leonardo, the Treasurer.
Good evening. Tonight, on behalf of Monroe Woodbury PTA Council and the PTA District, uh, PTA District Presidents, <clears throat> excuse me, we are giving our Community Connection Award to someone who truly embodies the MW District school spirit through her unwavering dedication to our community. She is a shining example of the district's mission. Her tireless efforts to advocate for and support families in our community demonstrate her deep commitment to making a positive impact on the world around her. Her compassion, generosity, and selflessness are a true inspiration to all who know her, and her contributions to the community are truly invaluable. I am honored to present our Community Connection Award to Bernie Vega. Please come up and get your award. Final item on our agenda, as Mr. Seriola mentioned earlier, is being moved to next week's Board of Education agenda because uh, Jenna Rowan Delson is unable to be here to be recognized. Um, the retiring staff and the tenured staff will be recognized after our break. I think we have a break coming up now. Yes, there are refreshments in the. Yeah, well, I don't know. Should he, he be saying the recess? Say is it, I, I can say the recess. Really. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, that's, I don't think that's supposed to be me. Go ahead. You, you want to <laughs> convene into a recess? No business is going to be conducted? <laughs> we will convene into a recess where no business will be conducted and join and come back into the room in a short period of time. You Thank you. Refreshment.
So what are we up to? We're up to. We're still on recognition. Seven. We're going to stop that. And now we're going to go to the superintendent tenure recognition. The recognition of the First, you're going to ask for a tenure recommendation. So then they can get an award. Okay. Well, this one we've already motioned. Yep. Six. So yep. Number seven. Okay. Motion, and then we start. Hello, we'd like to move back into the board meeting. No board business was discussed during the break. Next up is the superintendent's tenure recommendations. Ms. Rodriguez, may I turn it over to you? May I make a motion to Accept the tenure recommendations from Ms. Rodriguez. Motion. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Ms. Hawk. Good evening. It is my pleasure to present for recognition the men and women who have been approved for tenure this evening. Congratulations. They're a talented, passionate, and dedicated group of people who have already had a tremendously positive impact on our school community. We're thankful for the work they do with our children and we wish them long, successful careers in the Monroe Woodbury Central School District. If you're in our audience tonight, I ask that when your name is called, you come up on stage, remain on stage for a group picture. We're gonna begin with the high school. Congratulations to Rebecca Abramson, science teacher. Christian Hughes, teacher of world language. Biology teacher, Jessica Mortensen. Teacher of library media services, Bryn Spear. English teacher, Holly Spinelli. At the middle school, congratulations to sixth grade teacher, Caitlin Campbell. And Angelica Giordano, teacher of ENL. <laughs> Special education teacher, Mallory Greenberg. <laughs> teacher of Library Media Services, Rachel Lujbley. At Central Valley, remedial reading teacher, Christina Buona, Bu oh, I knew I was gonna do it. <laughs> Buonamano. <laughs> ENL teacher, Aaron Mullen. Pine Tree and Sapphire, art teacher, Mallory Spina. At 
at Smith Clove Elementary, special education teacher, Kimberly Hentz. Elementary teacher, Brianna Laird. Another teacher at Smith Clove, Nicole Miro. <laughs> District wide speech and hearing teacher, Carolyn Berkowitz. Behaviorist, Caitlin Connolly. <laughs> District wide psychologist, Stephanie Santiago. We also have three teaching assistants who are granted tenure this evening from the high school, Rosa Severo. From Pine Tree, Amanda Gervin. Also from Pine Tree, Melinda McCall. And finally, we have three administrators who are granted tenure this evening as well. From the high school, Vice Principal Jason McElroy. <laughs> Middle school, Assistant Principal Gina Dudgeon. and the principal of Sapphire Elementary School, Caitlin Caldwell. Congratulations to our newly tenured staff. Welcome to the Monroe Woodbury family.
Okay. Guys are up there. While they're all still smiling, let's give them one more big round of applause to our newly tenured employees. Tonight, I also have the honor of recognizing our district retirees. The individuals I'm about to present have amassed hundreds of years of service to our district and have had an impact on the lives of thousands of students. Amazing people like this are hard to find, difficult to part with, but impossible to forget. From the bottom of our hearts, we thank them for all they have done for our school, our community, and most importantly, our children. If you're in our audience tonight, I ask that when your name is called, you come up on, on the stage for what will likely be the last time. Unless, of course, you plan to take advantage of the New York State waiver on the earnings limitation for retirees, <laughs> we can always use substitutes. It was worth a shot. Uh, I'm going to begin. This is alphabetical, so you know when you're about ready to come up. And again, our sincere thanks and congratulations to William Albers, auto mechanic from Buildings and Grounds. <laughs> Susan Amenatides, school bus driver. <laughs> Aldous Ansons, director of food services. <laughs> Joanna Baez, teaching assistant. Mary Byer, school nurse teacher. Bob Bonney, custodial worker. Jody Cavanaugh, technology teacher at the middle school. <laughs> Janet Curtis, bus attendant. <laughs> Joan DiLorenzo, technological support assistant. <laughs> Cheryl Dennison, cook manager. Karen Farley, North Main teacher. <laughs> Brian Judice, Pine Tree principal. Kim Gulick, bus driver. Dennis Kristansky, computer technician. Nancy Kinnick, 
telephone operator. <laughs> Diane Laxman, teacher aide. <laughs> Eric Lenza, head custodian. <laughs> Elizabeth Lynch, school bus driver. Edma Tott, special ed teacher at the middle school. <laughs> Kathy McCarthy Aldinger, high school special ed. <laughs> Barbara McGinn, school bus driver. <laughs> June Ann McInerney, teacher assistant. Melissa McNamara, AIS Math. <laughs> Linda Miller, Teaching Assistant. <laughs> Kathleen Murray, School Monitor. Barbara Nusinoff, teaching assistant. <laughs> Ellen Olson, pine tree teacher. <laughs> Laura Pozzola, pine tree teacher. Susan Polka Garces, school psychologist. Middle school typist, Carol Polizzi. School security aide, Lou Roman. School security aide, Martha Runk. Pine Tree Library Clerk, Ann Sherman. Smith Clove music teacher, Merritt Sinet. <laughs> Middle school teacher, Jennifer Thompson. <laughs> Teaching assistant, Jean Townsend. <laughs> Dan Warnick, Middle School Technology. and high school assistant principal, Heath Yarmus. Congratulations to all of our retirees. We wish you a happy and healthy retirement. Thank you.
One more big round of applause for our retirees. Yes. <laughs> I know. We ready? Can I start? Okay. Yeah, it so nice. <laughs> yes. Six? Yes. The news. <laughs> yes, they said it. And I quit so uh, the only 23 one. years ago, so yeah. no So half a day is three packs? So exciting mm -hmm. for them. So six hours is a pack and a half. <laughs> go down hard for him. What am I going to do? <laughs> There's a couple of places. Holy cow. It's going to be like, how much Look at Patrick Nixon. Enough for a pack of <laughs> I've never smoked in my life. Who's missing? That's like two cigars, right? So. Oh, Jim. Some like in the other rare world. Yeah, we I think can we can start. Yes. Hopefully okay, we are up to number nine on the agenda, canvas of the vote and adoption of resolution declaring the results of the annual election held on May 16th, 2023. May I have a motion? Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> number 10, approval of the minutes. May I have a motion? Motion. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Action items 11.1 .1, approval of the textbooks. Are there any questions from the BOE? Yeah, I would just like maybe a quick summary from Dr. Hassler as to what the process is to ordering new textbooks. Sure. Um, tonight we, we have two recommendations. One is give, give me liberty in American history, the AP edition, and then we also have the uh, biology for an AP course. So basically, um, a, a typical process for approving textbooks or recommending textbooks um, usually starts with the committee at the building level. Uh, I'll, I'll use the, the AP uh, example, the AP American History example, where we have three teachers at the high school. This textbook is for AP U.S. History. We have three teachers that teach the AP U.S. History class. Um, they go out and they get samples and they bring them in and they review them and they kind of pare it down to sort of a few finalists, like two or three, where they actually get the full um, accompaniment of all of the materials that go along with it, and they basically pilot it within the classroom. So the book that's being recommended this evening was one text that they reviewed fully within the classroom. Uh, the second is the American Pageant, and basically they get copies of that. They teach lessons using each of the books. They get feedback from the kids, um, and then they ultimately settle on the books that are recommended. So that's that's a very very common practice that's utilized by all of the departments, regardless of the level that they that they're working with. Yep. Any other questions? May I have a motion to approve the textbooks? Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Update on goals presentation. All right, thank you. So thank you for having us. Thank you for allowing uh, us to present tonight. Uh, there are a number of people to say thank you to. First, I want to start by saying thank you to Eric to my left. Um, he's he's a, your solid partner. And thanks to Matt. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, the administrators and our, our, our educational team for all their help and support. Uh, for the people on the board, obviously, for our Board of Education and our, our cabinet, um, thank you for helping to guide this entire process. And then before we get on, this is always one of the, our favorite nights uh, of the school year because you get to recognize so many people, both students and staff. So congratulations to everyone who's been recognized tonight. What you have, the first few slides are really just a review. Um, we're not going to, we won't spend too much time on the, the first few because 
Um, you could read through them, but over the year we've been talking about these, these goals. We started last summer, we've updated now a number of times, we've updated through our board grams, and this is our final update um, for this school year, and then over the summer we'll, I'm sure we'll be discussing goals again and formulating um, new goals for, for next year. But at the K-5 level, these were the action steps and deliverables based on our big goal number one, which really spans three cabinet members. So uh, myself, Eric's going to speak um, his part about the, the 612, and then Bargov next week will talk about um, how it all fits into his goal and, and technology um, and data. So he'll be focusing on that. We'll mention a little bit of what he'll be speaking about tonight, and then he'll go into much more detail next week. So these are the action steps uh, for, for K-5. You want to talk about 612? No, the, I mean, exactly what Matt said. The, these first three slides were taken directly from Elsie's presentation in September when she introduced the district goals to the Board of Education and to the community. So we're beginning with these slides just to provide an overview, and then we'll go into detail on each of the bullet items uh, in greater detail in a moment. Okay, so this was the first bullet, the first action step or deliverable for K-5 was aligning the curriculum to the state standards. And one of the things that, we, this year there certainly was a renewed emphasis and a renewed focus on data um, and information. Um, our curriculum that we t already teach is aligned to standards, but one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that beginning with standards was, is really important. Um, we wanted our standards to drive our instruction, to provide a roadmap for our, our teachers and our, our students um, with various checkpoints. And I'll begin with uh, one example. So one of, the, one of the items that we've been working on this year is reformatting our K-5 report card, which is important. We have one right now that um, was done a number of years ago, and it was aligned to, to state standards, but it was general in, in, in certain um, spots. So the example that you have in front of you is under the uh, subject of mathematics. On the report card for K-5, you have an area that was based on a standard. It's a topic of, of standards, which is operations and algebraic thinking. Students would receive a score of a 4, 3, 2, or 1 in operations and algebraic thinking. What we've done now is we've moved to the, the future grade 2 um, example, where we've, we've broken that down to give both teachers and parents and ultimately students more information and a better understanding of how they're performing. So instead of just having the general operations and algebraic thinking, getting a 4, 3, 2, or 1, because when you say, well, what, is that, what does that mean that you got a 4, 3, or 2, or 1? It's a lot harder to explain. When you break it down and say, okay, under this, um, this area, operations and algebraic thinking for grade 2, student adds within 20, subtracts within 20, represents and solves word problems, and, and goes on. With that, will ultimately do is give more information to parents uh, and a better understanding of how their students are, how their children are performing in, in each area. And uh, again, ultimately we want this to, to draw down to the, the student level where they really know how they got a four, why they got a four, or a three, or a two, or a one. Part of this committee work is also to create a rubric that goes with every single standard that's up there. So if, if ads within 20 is, is the tenet, um, in order to get a four, or three, or two, or one, the rubric will explain what a four in that category will look like, what a three would look like, what a two would look like, what a one would look like. We're trying to take guesswork out of report cards, and we want to make sure that it's aligned um, with the standards. So that's just an example of some of the alignment of the curriculum to state standards. Developing common assessments was um, another piece. We've talked about this a little bit, or we've talked about this a lot of it during the course of the year. We talked about the importance of consistency um, and, and the academic experiences of our, our students. We've talked about, um, we, we've sat up here and we talked about the importance of removing silos so that schools or grade levels and classrooms are, are, in a, are on a similar page when it comes to academics. One way to do that is by using common assessments, something that is, you know, more typical or was more typical at the secondary level, and you know, you'll, you'll speak a bit more about that. But what we've done this year is we've administered a district-wide um, ELA common assessment, a district-wide math common assessment for the three through five grades. Our math program, which is new this year, um, all, the, all the assessments have been the same throughout the, the district. So we've begun to analyze that. 
some of the work that, that we've done has also been in, on participation. We had entire presentation just on assessments. We'll have all of that data to you over the summer when we get all of those scores. That's another common um, assessment that we obviously will look to. Another thing that we're going to be doing is we use the STAR assessment as our benchmarking um, platform for both reading and math at the K-5 level. So three times a year, a student takes the STAR benchmark in reading, and then they also take it in math. One of the things we've done this year is we've done a deeper dive into what those results mean and how we can then use them across, across the curriculum to help drive instruction. Ultimately, trying to answer the question, which I think is an important one for all of you, are we making progress? Are students performing? Are we moving in the right direction? So what I put up there is an example, and I don't know how well you can see it um, at home, but I looked at, we have information about all of our students, all of our grade levels across the district, but what I did is I looked at the STAR scores, and I didn't use the spring scores because we're still in the administration period of the spring, um, the spring STAR. So I looked at fall to winter, and how did we do? And I looked at fourth grade math as a starting point. We could have done this for fourth grade ELA, could do it for a third grade ELA, you know, whatever the um, grade or, or subject. And then we looked at scaled scores. And a scaled score is an interesting um, and important way and oftentimes a common way that we look at, at scores because it's basically a zero to 1400 point scale from grades one through, one through 12. So you could have a scaled score in second grade of whatever your, your scaled score is. Third grade would be another one, and it shows you or tells you where during a particular time of the year um, where you're performing compared to, to your peers. So the, star cost, the, the scaled score that we saw in the fall for fourth grade um, math was an average of 975. By the time they took it again, in the, our fourth graders took it in the winter, they had improved 21 points and gone up to 996. Now, what does that mean? If you're wondering, what does that mean compared to, because that's just, those are just numbers, right? How does that, what does that mean? I don't want to tell you how you, you want to ask the question, but um, as far as where, the, where our students should be, if we looked at students who typically perform at, in the 50th percentile, right, the average range, in the, in the fall, in September, fourth grade students would be at, at a, an average range of 971. When they get to the winter, um, administration, in order to get to a 50%, you're looking at an average score of 990. So in both instances, our scores as a district were above average um, compared to the other students across the country who, who take the STAR. Um, one of the goals of this, and I'll talk more about it when I talk about MTSS and um, information, is understanding at what point we use the STAR to then determine intervention. The STAR comes with a recommendation as to when a student would receive intervention, but the STAR is just one bit of, of, it's one data point compared to a lot of different things that we look at. But I just wanted to make sure that I could show you how we're using some of the information that we're gathering. So the next goal or, or um, action item was to schedule a curriculum night for the 2022-2023 school year. We held a, a, a virtual chat um, in February, we had 10 people outside of the administrators and um, the, the, the staff who participated. We've had an additional 72 views on YouTube. So my hope is that after this presentation, all the people who are watching this, that number will skyrocket and you can go back and watch all the things that we talked about in February um, about the rest of this year and, and going forward for next year. I'm sorry, can I just bug you, Matt, to sure. direct where to find that? Because I'm searching right now and I can't even find it on here. So how, if they wanted to go back to look at that, would they find it? So I would type in virtual. Well, if, if you, at the bottom of the webpage, there are the links of all of our social media sites. One of them is YouTube. If you click YouTube, under videos, okay. all of the district video posts for the year are there, okay. including the elementary chat and the middle school chat. Okay. <laughs> we only have 67 views, unfortunately. So. I know, because I, I mean, I just typed in Crusader chat, but it comes up with something from 2022. Yeah, if you if you click that the YouTube link at the bottom of the district webpage, it'll take you to the district's actual YouTube page. Okay. Under videos, every single video is there posted, and you can do a search on that for Crusader chat, and then it'll pop up. Okay. Is there a way to make that easier? Yeah, exactly. Like, sure. can we, we put can, it on the news page? Somewhere? We can work on that. Yep. Yeah. No problem. Sorry. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Kravitz, I did have a question about the previous slide, but I can sure. wait. So you said that we're, so we're doing slightly, sounds like slightly above average. So it, improvement is good, but is there, a, is there a level that we want to get at where we say, hey, we're really good? Is there a specific number that we're trying to get to, or is it just improvement? I think right now we're, we're honestly looking to see what our baseline is. We talked about that earlier in the start of the year. Coming out of the pandemic, how do we compare? What would our baseline be going forward? So I want to answer that, but I also want to see how we perform with this latest spring assessment. Um, and then we can, I'll be better able to, we talked about this as an administrative team about really delving into this a lot once the school year ends and we have all the information in front of us because I want to put something up there so you can see that we're looking at, at data and, and how important it is to us. But I, it's an incomplete picture at this point. So once I have that, and we have that, we'll be better able to answer that question. Okay. Um, I'm not trying to, to okay. not answer it, but I, I think that in my head, at least in my head, makes sense. I'll take Mr. It. Mr. Kravitz, yes, um, is there another um, assessment that we're giving students? Another STAR exam? Yes, they're currently in the now? window, so that's yeah. why we don't have the information I don't up there. Think so the board understands. Can you explain what the window means? Sure. So we have a period of time where the, the STAR assessment is administered. So this year it's from the start of June until June 16th. So after June 16th, then we'll have all of our information gathered. I have bits and pieces of it for the students who have currently taken it. Um, I, but I, again, I don't want to share that and say, oh, here's exactly where we are because even though it's it's higher than that, I want to make sure we have the full amount of students. And all, all I just heard is that it's higher than that so far. So that's yeah, so that's good. Right. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and, it, and it's more than just one student who's taken it. So that's that's good. But I do want to have, in order to be, you know, best be able to compare it, we should have all the information. Okay, thank okay. you. So vertical horizontal alignment or, or mapping and updating the pacing guides for math and ELA is also some work that we've begun this year. As you know, we started a new math program called Envision Math, and I'll talk more about the professional development um, that's gone with that. But understanding and laying out this, this roadmap for the curriculum has been, is important. And understanding what we're doing in every subject area is, is important. We've gone back, or not gone back, well, we've enhanced our, um, our science program this year and our professional development when it comes to science. There are plans to do that even more next year. So what we want to basically do is look across the district and say, here's what you need to know in first grade for ELA, here's what we're doing in, in math, here's what we're doing in science, here's what we're doing in social studies. And we want to do that for every single grade level, put it all together because what we really want to do, and that's the work that will start over the summer and that will continue into next year, is we want to be able to look at it from a thematic um, standpoint. We also want to be able to tie in and say, all right, where are, where are some, some areas that we need to focus more? Um, is there something that we, we really need to hit in third grade that wasn't really you know, done in second grade or something that we really want to prep for in third grade so that we know that our students are, are really good to go come fourth grade? That's important. And ultimately, the, the reason that we're working on that is because, as an example, if I'm a first grade teacher, I want to be able to know what those students are coming to me with in, in, when they're done with kindergarten. I also want to be able to see what is expected of me as a first grade teacher before those kids get to second grade. And that shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a secret, right? And not that it is a secret now, but it's harder to get all that information because it's not in an organized manner. And those are the things that we're doing. But also for, and it's not just for teachers. Obviously, it's super important for teachers and it will, it's important for students, but it's really important for parents to have all that information in one spot. And that's something that we're continuing to work towards. Um, Sorry, and it, ultimately we want to answer the question, where does everything fit in? What we have up there is just an example. This comes right from our math, um, our math curriculum. This is an example of a, a really small section of the grade three pacing guide. I didn't want to put the entire pacing guide because it's really small font and it'd be really hard to read. But even just the first three topics, there are your areas of focus, there are your number of lessons that it typically should take, and then there are the number of days per topic. One of the things that we're going to be working on over the summer is now that we've lived with this program for a year, what, you know, we're, we need to, we just surveyed, um, I sent a survey out through all of our building administrators to our, our K-5 teachers to ask them, what pieces of the Envision Math program have you used? What, are you, what do you need more support with for next year? Has, you know, what have you run into to issues with if you have? Um, what's been the, the major hurdle, if there are any, to getting you what you need and getting your students what they need. I, again, we haven't gotten all of our responses yet, 
but I think one of the biggest areas of concern for our teachers right now is just time mm -hmm. at the elementary level. You know, you have an elementary teacher who's charged with teaching multiple subjects and doing a really great job with it in depth that I think everybody has constantly asked for, for more time to, in order to do that. Okay. Mr. Kravitz, I have a yes. question on that slide. Um, what is the goal? It says vertical horizontal alignment. What's the outcome that would be expected by making sure that that happens? Obviously, there's a purpose behind it. So the first purpose is to make sure we have all of our information we can see across the district from K through 5. It's a little, I don't want to say it's easier, but it's different at the secondary level. Um, but K through 5 to look at and understand where our students are starting, where we want our students to end, and all of the, um, the tools that we're going to need in order to get there. The information, what I would like at the end is for our teachers to have access to a one-stop shop of information, regardless of what grade level you're teaching, to know here's what happens in kindergarten, here's what happens in first grade. The report card is a start, but just to go back to the report card, because now teachers will have access. The administrators are just looking at it for the last time along with the report card committee. The goal is for next week for our K-5 teachers to look at all the comments. So just looking at that, so you have reading in kindergarten all the way through first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. The, the, the vertical and horizontal alignment would then go into more detail because that's just the standard. So now it's what topics are being taught in first grade or, or K through five um, in ELA, math, writing, science, social studies. So ultimately the goal is to create that document mm -hmm. so that you know, it's easier for our teachers and our, our parents to understand what we're can doing. I, can I jump in and say sure. something about that? I think one of the things also that you mentioned was, number one, it's clear expectations for everyone, for all the teachers. But when you start to create common assessments, it's important that the common assessments are, are designed with clear expectations. If you don't, if everybody's not on the same page and you administer a common assessment, what you're going to find is that some students will not be successful, not because of what they are unable to complete, but because they have not been given the same um, instruction. So that's part of why it would be really important to make sure that we have this, we call it a pacing guide or a vertical alignment, making sure that we're all aligned across the board so that we can have clear expectations for everyone and then to be able to administer a common assessment that's fair because everyone has received, you know, um, similar instruction. It could be off by a week or two, but, but the expectations are all clear. That's a great answer. Thank you. And I think that helps um, the parents watching. Mm -hmm. Like, what, yeah. why is that important? Which is really what I was trying to understand. You know, I've been in meetings, I understand it, but sometimes the parents don't always know, okay, it's a goal, why does it matter? You know, it's improving student outcomes, but through what means? Right. So that was helpful. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you also, Elsie. Ms. Rodriguez. So one of the last two um, under our using data to improve student outcome goal was Fonses and Pinnell training for staff. We wanted to recalibrate. It had been a couple of years since the, the F&P or the Fonses and Pinnell is one tool, one reading assessment that we have our, our students utilize um, at the K-5 levels. Pre-COVID, our, our teachers were aligned. We felt it's, it's in, basically a student sits with a teacher. It's, there's a running record component. A, a teacher listens for miscues or mistakes a student may make, and then they're assessed, uh, they're assessed and given a, a letter score. Because there is some subjectivity to it, one of the things, one of our goals this year was to realign and get everybody back on the same page. So we did that. And then I want to put an example just of, this is from a, one of our kindergarten classes in the district. These were the first five students on this particular teacher's roster. I won't tell you who the teacher is, and I obviously won't tell you who the students are. But this is an example of some of the data that we're, we're, we keep and some of the data that we review. So you have the STAR assessment that I spoke about briefly, the, the three benchmarks. Um, this particular teacher's class has finished the STAR exam in, in this current window, so that's why those STAR scores are up there. And this particular teacher has also completed their, their spring Fontes and Pinnell, so that's why those scores. And so you could see growth during the course of the year for every single student, whether they started at um, an A or a B, which is obviously a beginning, um, 
uh, beginning level in, in kindergarten and the progress that they've made throughout the course of the year. So again, it was just another example of some of the data that we're looking at and why the F&P and the realignment is, is important. We want to make sure that if a reading teacher is administering the, the, the F&P assessment and the classroom teacher is also, that we want to make sure that their scores were, were similar or more in line. Okay. And then the last bit for, for my section was were, were two things. One, to formalize the process to review student progress throughout the year. Again, going back to that information is really important, making sure it's consistent across the board. Removing those data silos, and one of the things that we did is we, we updated our, our MTSS forms, multi-tiered um, systems of support forms, which is basically if a, a teacher recognizes an, a student in, in need of additional support, they assess them, they, they walk through a, a series of um, check boxes to, to determine whether or not a, a student may need more support, but also gathering the information piece is really important. And making that information, what we're looking for in students, is, is an important measure for all of this. One of the areas that we're going to be talking about, and, and Dr. Vias will talk about it next week, is our dashboard of student information. And right currently we're using, we've started to use Unified Insights. Um, I don't want to take away all of your presentation, but, I, but that's something for, to really say for next week, because that is a big component of his presentation. And then the last um, action item were four half days of professional development. We, we did that. I added in other things that we've done, but basically at the K-5 level, our teachers have received, uh, amongst other things, they've received um, professional development in Science 21, which is the science program that we use, uh, Envision Math, STAR, Freckle, which is one of the, the tools that they've had access to, and then K2, by the end of next week, almost all of our K through 2 teachers will be trained in foundations, and I spoke about that earlier during the course of the year. Um, at the board level, as far as teachers feeling that they needed a multi-sensory um, approach to really enhancing the foundational skills for our, our early learners, and that foundations program is something that we're bringing in. Um, as I said, as of next week, all of, almost all of our K-2 teachers will be trained in how to use this program, and then there will be appropriate and necessary professional development come September. Do all the staff developments, do they come to our buildings, or do we go out? Or is it it's a combination of both. So we have, and, and now with the post-COVID world where we have access to uh, virtual sessions, some of it, I'll give you an example. The, the Science 21 cohort training for next year is offered in two ways. It's offered in person for a full day. Um, so if you're a third grade teacher, there are four in-person days. If you are going to do it virtually, because that's an option as well, it would be eight half days where they would receive that, that training. So the in-person would be on-site at PNW BOCES. The virtual, they would be, you know, obviously off-site doing their work. I assume that's staggered if we do go out, right? So if you're sending, like, the entire third grade doesn't go on the correct, same day. Correct, correct. Right? So what, the way we set it up is there, those three options. The, the way the half days work, there's morning and afternoon. So we have some teachers who are going the full day in-person training. It can't be all, you're right, it can't be all third grade because then we won't have anyone to teach third grade. Right. So the bu building admins it subs. polled the teachers and asked their, their preferences, um, virtual or or um, in person, and then we have to make sure that it's balanced so that, you know, subs being what they are, we want to make sure that's not a concern. Great, thank you. I'd like to make a request as the group looks at the goals for next year. Some of these things are a little kludgy, you know, F and P. General public doesn't know what that means. Gotcha. And I even leaned into Elsie and I said, what does that mean again? Because, um, there's so many acronyms in there school, are. and I work in finance, and there's a thousand acronyms. So I think it would just help for usability as we move along. And then MTSS, you know, so a lot of those kind of abbreviations, it's not always well known. You live in it, so it makes, makes more sense. But no, we I, could kind of spell that out a little bit more for clarity and transparency as we move into next year's goals. I think that would be great. And another piece of this is also the idea of enhancing the curriculum instruction part of our website. So that would another, be another spot where all those acronyms could live. Um, so yes, we can certainly do that at this level, but then also being able to refer you know, our public to that, that area as well. Thank Thanks. You.
I also appreciate that recommendation before my portion of the presentation. <laughs> so I'll, <laughs> I'll be sure to do that. I'm going to count yours as we go through. <laughs> um, so, so Matt started out with some thank yous. I, I, I quickly want to just, I want to thank Matt. Um, when we sat down and really were pulling all of our information together, Matt has brought a lot of color to our side, so to the curriculum instruction. So I, I don't know that my presentations in the past have been as colorful, so I, I, I have the ability to be able to kind of weave in some additional slides and charts, which has been very, very helpful. So Matt has brought a, a, a lot of that, so I appreciate that. Um, in terms of, of uh, the 6 through 12 side, um, we, we have some goals that are very similar to start out with. The first goal being align curriculum to state standards. Um, first and foremost, uh, <coughs> there are state standards in all of our curricular areas, um, not just the ELA Math, Science, Social Studies. It goes into all of the various departments. So, um, you know, we can both confidently say that all of our curriculum across the, across the school district is aligned to state standards. This is something that is an ongoing process. Even though th this was a goal this year, um, we annually are reviewing our curriculum to ensure that it is aligned to state standards, standards predominantly because many of our content areas have some form of standardized or state assessment that's attached to it. So we, we need to make sure that we're preparing our students accordingly. Um, the way that we do that is through summer curriculum work, summer curriculum last summer, summer curriculum this summer. Um, we, we had the benefit of having some additional professional development days. Uh, the department chairs at the secondary level have monthly curriculum meetings and department meetings, um, some of which is attributed to the review of curriculum and ensuring that. Another way that we ensure that the curriculum is aligned to state standards is through professional development. Um, we're, we, we make sure that we send our staff to PD over the course of the year because standards are continuously changing. I can give you a number of examples. Um, the shift of the state assessment in grades three through eight to the next gen ELA and math standards. Um, Orange ulster was was uh, uh, critical for us in terms of providing professional development to our, e our middle school ELA and math departments on that shift. Um, Matt spoke about uh, Science 21. At the secondary level, the, the PNW BOCES Science Department has done outstanding professional development in supporting the shift of the uh, fifth grade and the eighth grade science assessments as well as the regions exams as they move into the New York State um, Science Learning Standards, which are going to affect next year. Um, but even beyond, again, those, those core departments, We've done a variety of other professional development where our world language department had a training this year by the New York State Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages because starting in the fall of 2023, the world languages have a new set of state standards that they need to be implementing. So we're making sure that our curriculum is aligned to that. Um, you may recall that we uh, implemented this year our work-based learning program. In order for students to participate in the, in the work-based learning program, we had to make some adjustments in our business courses, so that way students who were in the work-based learning program were getting career and development and uh, occupational um, uh, instruction that related to those CDOS standards that are put by the state, because that's a requirement for them to participate in work-based learning. <laughs> so that, that work, even though it was a goal this year, it's ongoing on an annual basis. Doctor, when, when you're reviewing um, the curriculum, you're doing it not only to uh, align to state standards, but to other standards that you know, we have as a, as a district, right? Sure, and, and, and we make sure, obviously, you have the, the core content that is required for us, but then actually one of the other things that we also use to evaluate that are our assessments. So beyond just making sure that we're aligned to the standards, our assessments very much drive our curriculum to make sure that we, you know, are addressing things that, um, you know, based upon assessment results that we're doing very well in or deficiencies that we might identify and we make those necessary tweaks and adjustments. So, yeah, there, there are a variety of factors that go into the, the, the modification of curriculum. That's part of the, that's part of the um, movement towards the common assessments that we've been speaking about, where common assessments are utilized in a couple of different ways, similar to what Matt was speaking about earlier at the secondary level. So first and foremost, the most common assessments that we have at the secondary level are any form of standardized assessment, where the STAR exam is also administered through eighth grade, any form of state assessment, the three through eight testing, uh, the science assessments, as well as all the, regional, the regions exams. Those are administered consistently across large populations of students. 
However, common assessments look, as, as Matt was saying, look a little bit different at the secondary level because we have a variety of different courses as well. Um, to give you a basic example, I'm going to be talking a little bit about accelerated math later on in the presentation. Um, we have a seventh grade accelerated math course and we have a math seven course. So aside from those students being responsible for taking the math seven state assessment, all students take that exam and we've, we've presented those results to the Board of Education. Those students are also taking separate common assessments along the way in accelerated math seven and math seven based upon the curriculum and their progress through that curriculum. So the curriculum in math and accelerated math seven is not exactly the same as the curriculum in math seven. So those two cohorts of students have separate common assessments that they take that the teachers utilize to measure the student progress formatively through that curriculum. So the common assessment work that we've been doing has transcended across all of the various departments in all of the various courses that we offer in order to be able to do just that and measure student um, growth through the curriculum. So similar to what Matt was talking about earlier, again, we have the STAR assessment. We utilize those data points. Um, you know, we, we've done a presentation to the board about that. The example that Matt gave was fourth grade math. The example that I have is, is eighth grade ELA. Again, the, the information that Matt provided holds very much true at the, at the middle level as well with regards to the STAR exam. However, beyond that, Eighth grade math also takes a series of quarterly assessments. Teachers administer assessments four times a year. Those assessments assist the teachers in determining any sort of modification in the curriculum for that particular year for that cohort of students. But additionally, at the conclusion of the end of the school year, they go back and they review those assessment results to then allow them to make any modifications for any subsequent student populations that come in. Another goal of this as well, is the process of how we review student progress and how we utilize that common assessment data. One of the goals is as we continue to track that common assessment data is to be able to give teachers access to prior data beyond just like the STAR exam. So we have the historical data related to the STAR exam, but we can also track historical data um, related to the common assessments as well. That's utilized by a tool called Formative, which is an assessment tool that links to Google Classroom. I think I've spoken about it in previous presentations. Um, it's an assessment tool that links to Google Classroom. It also links to PowerSchool, which is our student management system, and Unified Insights that Matt spoke about earlier, where the results of those common assessments can go into that tool, and the teachers have the ability to be able to look back at past results. For example, um, the, high school math, uh, the high school English department is administering three common assessments over the course of the school year. There are three types of writing that we are required to teach over the span of the year. Narrative writing, writing for information, and writing for opinion. That, those three standards are consistent by every grade level as the students progress through the curriculum, regardless of the grade level. So using this process and this tool, moving forward into the future, a teacher will be able to look back to see how a student did on that common assessment in narrative writing in a previous school year to potentially determine how that student is going to be and maybe understand more about what that student needs in subsequent years when they receive that student. That's the benefit of the tracking process that we are working on. And again, Dr. Vias is going to be speaking about that in greater detail um, at, at his presentation next week. Dr. Hassel, I have a sure. couple of questions. Sure. If we can go back one slide. Sure. So this is a full comparison to winter for grade eight. Correct. How many grades took this? The, the, the STAR assessment is administered kindergarten through eight. Every student takes it. Okay. So six and seven would have taken it. Correct. But we only have the results here for eight. Correct. Um, and I see a change of 13, which is 1.2% increase. Is a 1.2% change good? Here? So you, you can make a comparison in that way, similar to what Matt had spoken about earlier. There's actually... Um, grade level ranges that exist for what the average range is for fall, what the average range is for winter, what the average range is for spring. So the scaled score is not necessarily going to increase in the manner that you are speaking about. The comparison is made based upon the norms that have been established by STAR because this is a, a normed assessment that's administered to students all across the country. It's not isolated exclusively to Monterey Woodbury. So how did grades six and seven do? 
So I can go back and I can gather that information and present it for you if you'd like. I, I would like to see that. Sure, no problem. Any other questions? You said you had other questions. So those were my, the percentage, the, you know, really it was around that slide. Okay. Um, I think it's important that we look holistically at sure. all of the grades and mm -hmm. not a selected grade because was that grade selected because it showed a positive result and other ones showed negative? I don't know, and the, comp the public won't know unless yep. we see the data. Sure, yeah, yep. Will we see that at the next meeting then? Or but Next week? Yeah. Next meeting, yeah. Next meeting. I mean, I don't know. I could try to pull it together okay. for you. I, I, my, recommendation, I my, my recommendation would be, similar to what Matt said, you probably want a holistic look across the entire year rather than just, like, the growth from a fall to a winter benchmark is probably more ideal when you look at the growth over the course of the entire year. I think that that's a better approach to take, but... So, I, I mean, I... If the BOE has other thoughts, I think going forward when this type of data is presented, mm -hmm. this also goes for your area, Matt. Right. We need to holistically see all of the data. Right. That way we can opine on it, ask questions on it, see what the trends are. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be great if we could have the numbers at the next meeting since I'm sure you have them. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can do a much more deeper dive when you get the this assessment that you're going through now. Sure. We'll be ready in what, a month or two? It would, mm -hmm. right. And I think it would make sense to also tie in, you know, that information along with our state our state results, which we'll get in August. So I don't want to, I don't, I don't create the agendas, but I think it would make sense to tie it into our, our next big assessment um, presentation that would be, you know, focused solely on. We could do that too. So I just want to be clear on what the, what the objective is. You would like to see... This star is administered K-8. K-8. So you would like to see, let me show you K-8, K-8, through eight, all the kids in kindergarten, all the way to eighth grade, and do the same comparison we have here. So a chart that would show you the students K-8. through eight. Correct. Okay, I just want to clarify that. Yeah. Yeah. On a, on, on a district-wide average for that grade level. Yes. Correct? Okay. But just like you did here, but K-8. through eight. Sure. Okay. And then later on, seeing it for spring as well. Yes. Yes. So, I spoke about the formalized process for reviewing student progress. Were there any other questions about that? <clears throat> so, the, the, next part, the next goal was to review the academy program. So, the academy program is our credit recovery program here at the high school. Um, credit recovery is what allows students to try to maintain their pathway towards graduation. Uh, for example, if I'm a, a student and say the, the student passes the Algebra Regents exam in June, however they don't pass the class in Algebra, they either have the option of attending summer school in order to be able to get the course credit for that. You don't only get course credit by passing the Regents exam, you also need to pass the course. So um, the student either has the option to go to uh, summer school in order to be able to get that credit, or if the student doesn't have the ability to be able to go to summer school, we have a program after school called the Academy. What the Academy allows students to be able to do is they can take a course in the academy and still continue with their traditional courses during the school day. So to use that algebra example, the student would be able to take geometry during the day the following year, which would allow them to stay on target in terms of credit acquisition towards graduation, and then still earn the algebra credit in the afternoon by going to the academy. Otherwise, if the student had to repeat taking algebra, that's one less course that they would be able to take during the day and they could potentially be behind in that progress towards getting math credit. So the academy allows students to be able to gain that credit that they might not have been able to achieve throughout the school year. So for us, the academy runs uh, in the evenings. The courses are either Mondays and Wednesdays or Tuesdays and Thursdays, and there are two periods. One is from 2.10 to 3.30, to and the second is from 3.35 to 4.55. Um, I'm giving you results, overall results, for the Academy program in 21-22 because the Academy is still running now and we haven't finalized how many kids have actually completed credits for the 22-23 school year, but I wanted to give you a full sort of understanding about how many kids, how many kids earn credit. Last year during the 21-22 school year, we had 57 students that attended the Academy at some point. 
Out of the 57 students, 36 of them were seniors. 26 of those seniors were able to graduate in June of 2022 because they acquired one or more credits in the academy after school. Had the students not been able to participate in that program, they could have potentially been behind in their ability to be able to graduate. Last year, the academy ran 16 different courses, and we had 11 different teachers teaching those 16 courses. All total, the 57 students were able to acquire 63 credits towards graduation. So basically what that means is if the students weren't able to participate in the academy program, they would potentially have been occupying a seat in a class the subsequent school year that otherwise now gave them the ability to be able to free up time in their schedule to continue on and hopefully graduate still on time. So far now for the 22-23 school year, we have 76 students that have attended the academy. We have 19 different courses that are running and we have nine teachers that are teaching it. I will be able to come back and report to the board at the end of the school year how many kids ultimately um, acquire credits and the number of seniors that were able to graduate on time, um, but that's the rough breakdown of the academy program. In terms of costs, the academy costs approximately, uh, averages about, depending upon the number of courses and the number of teachers, it's about $58,000, and then we have a nurse also in that program that's usually approximately about $16,000. So that's the, the rough breakdown of the review that occurred of the academy. Yep. yep. Do, do most students or any of the students take more than one class in the academy? Um, yeah, we, there are quite a few students that do take multiple, cl multiple classes in the academy. And, and the amount of time that they spend in the academy depends upon how deficient they are in the credit. Um, you know, some kids, because, you know, they may not have passed because they didn't have enough seat time and they may need to make up a sizable amount so of time. They have to stay the whole semester. Right. It, it depends upon the level of completion that they did of the course during the, you know, during the, their previous experience in that course. Um, my questions are, so what happened to the other 10 seniors? Are we to assume that they graduated in August? Did they um, have other they, I can find out for you. Um, it, they basically did not meet the, the requirement in order to be able to do that. And it's, it's, the academy runs very similar to summer school, where summer school has a very scripted number of seats, where basically if, you don't, if you're not in school enough, you don't get the credit, and then you end up having to come back the, you know, the following year. So, those seniors, either some of whom attended summer school, if you attended summer school graduation, you might have seen kids, but there are also kids who they can't stay after school either. So some, you know, it, it varies they from students. for the summer, you're saying? Right. Possibly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Regardless, the 10 kids that weren't able to graduate either had to go to summer school, depending upon their level of deficiency towards graduation, or they would have to return the following school year. Okay. And then my other question is, we had an increase in students, but a decrease in teachers. Right. Why is that? Well, the, the reason why is that teachers, it, it depends upon the teacher's certification. For example, an English teacher can teach <laughs> English 9, English 10, English 11, and English 12. Science teachers can only teach one course. You're only si science certified or biology certified or earth science certified. So it depends upon the needs of the courses and the certifications of the teachers. So those nine teachers, even though there's 19 courses, you have the ability to have teachers doubling up on multiple courses if they have the proper certification. Does that make sense of, of the way that I'm explaining it? Yeah. Is it only for kids that fail? Um, typically, yes. We have some students where, um, and it's usually like in like health classes and things like that, where they may not have room in their schedule, where they may be short like a, a health class or, or something like that, but the, the vast majority of the students who participate are there for credit recovery. majority pass um, I, yeah I mean again you're, you're talking about 57 students 36 of them were seniors 26 of those students were able to complete the vast majority do pass yes are students able to still perform in extracurricular activities the ask school program um, they failed the class likely mm -hmm. right and they play a sport but obviously this is after school, so I'm assuming the sport would conflict with yep. the class, right? So that basically ensures that they won't participate in whatever. Correct. Correct. 
It also, once if they fail a class, they, they're academically ineligible. Ineligible, today. right. Post courses. How long have we been running this program? Oh my goodness, it's been quite, I don't know how, how many years, it, it's I'm been quite a few this, years. This program um, was approved, I think, 15 years by the board. The Board of Education had to approve the program. I did my homework, and I did see that it was approved about 15 years ago. I was a middle school principal when it was approved. It was. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> so the next goal is the implementation and use of Naviance for sixth graders and ninth graders. Uh, just as a quick overview, Naviance is our college and career tracking tool. It's a system where students have the ability to log in. Um, it, it, they can conduct interest inventories to potentially su uh, pursue different careers. Um, they can do research on colleges and professions. They can do research on scholarships, and it tracks all student information. It also allows them to essentially build their resume, um, acquire letters of recommendation for college applications and things like that. So prior to now, um, Naviance was a tool that was originally introduced to students in eighth grade. Um, the introduction that happened in eighth grade was very basic. Moving into ninth grade was when students started to do their interest inventories and begin starting to plan their, um, you know, their, their post-graduation, you know, assemble their post-graduation plan. Um, now that we started to think about Naviance for sixth grade, uh, Naviance is being inserted into sixth grade seminar where we had the sixth grade seminar teachers trained uh, in the, in, I believe it was in December when the training took place. And we started with an overview of Naviance for the sixth graders in seminar in the spring, which basically seminar is a semester course. So that means that for the 22-23 school year, half of the sixth graders were able to participate in this overview of Naviance. The goal being now that it's in sixth grade seminar, the entire sixth grade for the 23-24 school year will receive this introduction. The benefit of starting at Naviance in sixth grade rather than eighth grade is it allows the teachers to be and the guidance counselors to be able to start to do some of those interest surveys with students in the middle school. The plan for that is for students to start taking those surveys in the, when they take their family and consumer science courses. The, the family and consumer science teachers will work with the students in Naviance to be able to um, start to develop those interest inventories. The benefit of doing that in um, in, in the middle school is that by having that completed, the students can not only start planning for post-graduation, but it can also assist them in determining some of the pathways and the trajectory that they can do in course selection in the high school as well, whether it be um, you know, college level courses or technical courses. Um, by having some of those interest inventories done prior to coming to the high school, it can assist with high school course selection as well. So by having that in place, the guidance counselors at the high school level then will be able to meet with the students in ninth grade and 10th grade and ensure that those items are in place for them in planning their course of study moving forward nine through 12. Dr. Hassler, sure. do you have, um, or does leadership have reporting on usage and activity? Um, I am aware that there are some challenges at times with Naviance. Yeah, th th there are a number of different, I mean, we, we're ironing through a number of different challenges, for example, this year, and I don't know if, if, if Bargov wants to be able to speak about some of that. Part of the part of the challenge, part of the challenge that we've we'll had him next time. Well, yeah, part of, part of the challenge, part of the challenge with Naviance is um, their accessibility to students who, um, you know, they have to receive information from an outside source because Naviance is a third party tool. So in order for the students to be able to log in, there has to be a dialogue between them and an outside. Um, you know, this outside entity for them to be able to unlock that. That previously existed for eighth grade. We're now working on unlocking that for the younger grade levels and having that accessibility. So right now, the demo that took place this year is a general overview of Naviance. The next step would be for them to be able to have that full access to those, in, the, the inventories that I was speaking about earlier. So on average, what's the percentage of usage of an actual grade you know, how many of our students percentage-wise are actually using it? Well, I, I don't have that information just yet because right now it's only been introduced to half of the sixth grade. But previously, it was 100% of eighth graders okay. that used that because they were doing the interest inventories in family and consumer science. 
And is there any type of usage or satisfaction survey sent out? To no, we, we could do that. Sure. Yeah. Um, just to get feedback, you know, if it's easy to log in, navigate, use, um, just to make sure that you're, you're capturing yeah. those challenges. Sure. I mean, obviously, the goal being for those that have really dug deeply into the tool, it's a very usable tool. Mm -hmm. um, but it's making sure, I think, that one, you know, part of the reason why this is a goal is making sure that it is widely accessible and people under, understand the extent of the usage of that tool. And I think that that's the goal of bumping it up now to sixth graders to try to expand that use. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, similar to the elementary level, we, we had a goal for scheduling a curriculum night. Um, the high school scheduled the curriculum night that was held on February 2nd that was for incoming 8th graders. They also held a, an elective fair for students on February 3rd for them to learn about electives that are available. That, that was for, during the school day for students uh, to learn about electives that are offered at the high school. We also had a crusader chat on February 28th at the middle level uh, around curriculum as well, which is also accessible on the YouTube channel that we will do uh, um, some review to make sure that that's more it's accessible. A while to find it on the YouTube channel. Got you. So it's just. Yeah, I think because it, it's February. The, the way that I said to you, it's it's deep down there. There's a lot of videos that have been posted since then. Yep. Elementary has 67 uh, has 73 views. We only had 67. For the elective fair, uh, you said that's during the day. It was during it, the, the the elective fair was was targeted for students for the students to be able to learn about the elective options up at the high school. What do we do for parents so that they learn about electives? So, because they're hopefully guiding their children. Yep, um, that, that's part of the conversation about how we can increase the access to the program of studies for parents to be able to do that. I mean, obviously, for those of you that are at the secondary level, the high school sends out a number of different emails throughout the course selection process about where the program of studies is and things like that. But I think that we, you know, we're, we're in discussions about how we can do evening sessions as well for parents to be able to access that information. Yeah, I think that would be, I mean, Something that's interactive that's not necessarily computer based. Right. Right for yep. schools. And then my, uh, the BOCES, I believe they go 10th grade to BOCES. No, uh, 11th and 12th. 11th and 12th. Yep. No, when they learn about the programs because they select. Oh, yes. When, when, right. Yes. Students have the opportunity to be able to go visit the CTEC programs when they're in 10th grade for either 11th grade or 12th grade enrollment. Correct. And do we push that to parents as well? So like, do they know that their kid's going there? Are they there to guide their kids so that they can have yeah. a conversation at home about those trades and those arts? That in, in order for students to be able to do that visit, there's a permission slip that the parent, along with a lot of documentation that goes home, in order for kids to be able to do that. Because it is actually a physical field trip that students go in order to be able to visit that program. Are the parents so, allowed to do that as well? Are, are the, do the parents? I don't think that parents are allowed to visit the program. I think it's just the students. So that's maybe we, we could something we could look into as well, because again, the parents are ideally involved in all these decisions, and pushing their kids to at least take a valuable look at an alternative, yeah, you know, choice for a career. I don't, I don't know if that's something that BOSIS does, but we can certainly check into that. Thank you. Sure. So the next goal was to utilize the system for tracking and earning college credits. Um, we, we developed a tool uh, at, at the end of the first semester because we have two types of dual enrollment classes. Dual enrollment classes are courses that are offered both for high school credit as well as college credit. Um, you have semester courses that run and then you have year-long courses that are offered for college credit. So we did a, a trial at the end of semester one where we basically created a spreadsheet and any teacher who was a dual enrollment teacher provided us with the number of credits earned by students. In order for them to earn a credit, they have to pay tuition and they have to get a certain score and then that grade gets submitted to the college which allows them to ultimately get a, a transcript from the, the institution. Any teacher who is a dual enrollment teacher uh, provided that information and a field was created in PowerSchool again which is our student information system in order to be able to track that. With the goal being now that we're ending the school year, both semester two dual enrollment courses as well as the year-long dual enrollment courses, the teachers would complete the, that spreadsheet and it would populate the field in PowerSchool. The benefit of doing this now, it gives us the ability to be able to do an analysis of um, how many kids are acquiring college credits, how many college credits they're acquiring, um, and maybe trying to understand some of the decisions of why kids are or are not choosing to 
to pursue those college credits. Um, right now, if Eric Hassler is graduating from the high school, we have a number of different dual enrollment um, courses offered through a number of different colleges. Eric Hassler knows the courses that I took over my time in the high school and which institutions I have transcripts and how many credits I've earned for those. Using this tool, it'll allow us to be able to have full access and to be able to celebrate how many kids we know that our kids are graduating with many college credits. This will be able to allow us to identify exactly how many credits our kids are graduating with. Um, and then also be able to make some adjustments in terms of you know, understanding why kids are, are or are not um, you know, deciding to be able to take the, the courses for those credits. Are there colleges that don't accept the dual enrollment courses? There are. I mean, it depends upon the school, whether you're going to, you know, the, the vast majority of the dual enrollment courses that we offer are through the SUNY system, whether it's SUNY Orange, uh, SUNY Albany, we have SUNY, um, I think SUNY Oneonta. If you're transferring to a SUNY school, that, that's one set of criteria in terms of transferring. Sometimes if you transfer to a private school, they may not accept them or they accept them differently. That's similar to the AP on the AP side, depending upon your AP score. Um, so it, it really depends upon which school you, you know, you're transferring to. Sometimes they just take it as an elective, which is still a credit. For yeah, them. typically that's what happens. Yeah. If, if, it's not, if it's not transferred for an actual okay. course requirement, right. a lot of times <laughs> they'll accept it as an elective. A lot of times if, um, if it's within your, your field of, of study, they may still require you to be able to take that specific course at their college if you're getting a degree in that specific area. Um, but otherwise, you know, the, especially if you're transferring within the student system, there are a lot of courses that do transfer. I think to Jeff's point, we definitely have to do a better job of advertising that to parents. Mm -hmm. I've heard from several senior parents this year, which I was surprised that they're first time senior parents. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't know that their students were eligible to get, you know, even three credits, let alone even more than that. Right. Um, you know, I think we put a lot of faith in our high school seniors, mm -hmm. and I get that we want them to be independent, but some kids aren't going home and telling mom and dad what the teacher told them in school that day about right. the dual enrollment class. Yeah. So it's unfortunate then that, you know, had the parents known about it, they may have, you know, nudge their student a little bit more to, to enroll in that. And right. that's also a process, I mean. Sure, and, and, and again, that's the, the, the goal of this, first and foremost, is to us, for us to have basic data on how many credits our kids are actually acquiring. Again, you know, ultimately, we would be able to look up Eric Hassler, and we would be able to look at my transcript to see, even though I may have taken this class, which was offered through SUNY Albany, and this class, which was offered through SUNY Orange, in the end, we'll be able to see how many credits Eric Hassler has acquired over my time while in the high school. Um, and then I think we can drill down to a lot of the other things that you're talking about is, you know, why are kids, you know, and, and does it vary by courses? It seems like many kids in this course are taking it for college credit, but not many kids in this course are, are taking it. So trying to understand what, you know, the, the thought process behind some of those decisions. And then also, I think, increasing the advertising as well about the benefit of it. I do think it's important because my daughter had over 30 something credits mm -hmm. and half of them were disallowed because mm -hmm. advisory didn't let her know. She took too many social studies courses. Right. So had she known or had we known, we would have tried to push her in a different direction to right. consider. What she did is she took what she liked, which is great. Right. But getting the college credits didn't help her because she lost half of them. Right. So I really do think it's advisory's job to mm -hmm. make sure that the parents and students are well informed. Right. And if there's an agreement to take them just to learn and grow, that's fine. But knowing that you might get those credits disallowed as you did the work for them was a bit frustrating for right. her at the end of the day. And right. then you pay twice. Yes. Right. Exactly. Do we know what kids who graduate Monroe Woodbury and go on to either two or four year institutions, what they major in? And because really my question is, is our curriculum for those classes setting up those kids so they have an idea when they're going in? Yeah. So if I, you're a psych major, you know, how many psych classes are we offering for college credits? Because we know, you know, 40% of the kids from a world where we are taking, you know, a liberal arts degree. You know what I mean? So if it, we can tailor it from basically working, reverse engineering it, I think that that could maybe help our kids give a better track so when they leave here, they're like Mike, Mike just said, you know, hey, I'm interested in this. They, they, in high school, take some classes. They confirm that, yes, this is what I want to do. And then they can 
not heavy load them apparently, but at least load in that direction that they're checking off, you know, English 101 and all that, it's different. But. I have to check and see. I don't know. I know that Naviance has the ability to be able to track once you become a senior and you apply for college, it tracks students, the applications that they submit, acceptance, <laughs> what the grades are that they, you know, what their profile is in general. So we do know, you know, Monroe Woodbury acceptance rate at various schools, what, what schools our kids are going into, the choices that they're making and things like that. I don't know if it drills down to what their major is or not, but I can check on that. I think it's, and again, I, don't, I didn't do it last year with my daughter. She did her own. But I feel like there's a spot in there, but it's you have to go back in and do it. Right. I, I don't know. You have to be, and I don't know, again, how many of our students, like right. once my son decided on what he was doing, I don't know that he logged back into Naviance to let Naviance know that he was going right. here for this major. Right. Well, you have but to. I, I just did it last night. You, you have you to have let to. them know because they have to send the final transcript. So when you fill out your senior right, survey, but do they say the major? Because I don't remember. They do not that. ask the major. They ask yeah. what's right. I think I think it's an and that's what right. I mean by I don't know how I, I don't know what the capability is and I don't know how reliable the data that's in there to yeah. be able to like pin it down. But um, I, I do know that uh, acceptance rate colleges the, the, that information is in there. Um, but I, I have to double check on the major. Awesome. Uh, so the next item, uh, uh, the next goal was to review academic schedules. So um, the, both the high school and the middle school developed scheduling committees uh, where they basically did respective research within their buildings. Um, one of the things that we did globally, both at the middle school level and at the high school level, was uh, sending out a survey to all of Orange Ulster BOCES, all of Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES, high schools and middle schools, for them to give us feedback on their general schedules. Um, from those results, we reached out to individual schools to speak with them in greater detail on alternatives to the traditional schedules that are out there, which for the vast majority of, of school districts is a nine period schedule similar to ours. Um, so we connected with a number of different schools to learn about, uh, we had you know, online visits with them to learn about the various scheduling options and the process that they went through in terms of uh, uh, reviewing their schedules. Beyond that, the middle school also um, administered a survey to their staff. Uh, 94 people responded to that survey. There was approximately 270 staff members who received that survey. That survey went to all the entire staff of the middle school. Um, the, I, I received the question on whether or not uh, the survey was specific to staff members who had an advisory. It was not. Uh, the reason why it was sent out to all staff is uh, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, the number of advisories in the middle school is dependent upon enrollment. So if enrollment goes up, they have to add additional advisors. If enrollment goes down, they, um, they remove advisors. So there are some teachers currently teaching who previously have had an advisory who may not have an advisory during this year. And they wanted to make sure that they captured feedback on the schedule in general, but specifically advisory from the staff. Um, beyond that, there's also staff who participate in advisories in supportive capacities, whether they be monitors. Um, they wanted to hear feedback about advisory from uh, security staff and, and things like that. What are the, what's going well with the schedule, what's not going well with the schedule. So that, that scheduling survey went out to the entire middle school staff, which is approximately um, about 270 people. So about, about a third, a little over a third responded. The major takeaway from that scheduling survey from the staff was they felt that the current state of advisory needed to be modified and addressed because of a, a, a number of different problems. Most notably was student attendance. Um, one of the things that they realized after the pandemic is we have many, many parents that are driving their children to school and the advisory starts at 815 um, and period, period one starts at 835. There are many, many students that are being driven to school and parents are dropping them off at 830 and students are just missing advisory altogether. Um, and that's having a, a number of different impacts. So the, the overwhelming response from the middle school staff survey was that there needed to be some sort of um, modification and adjustments in middle school advisory. Um, the high school also conducted a survey. Uh, the survey that they sent out went out to students. Um, they received 743 responses out of about a little over 2,300 kids. So again, we're right about that one-third response rate. 
Um, the feedback from the student survey was that 75% of the students felt that the, the current schedule gave them their schedule of choice as well as the class, they were able to get access to the classes that they um, felt that they wanted to take. Uh, and that 73% of the students preferred having the current nine period, 40 minute schedule. That, that was the, the general takeaways from that. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, there are a variety of things that are, are still being looked at. One of them being the advisory piece from the middle school. Uh, actually, Mr. Berger is going to be doing a presentation to the board next week about um, some modifications that they're looking to implement in advisory at the middle school based upon the feedback from the survey. Uh, one of the main topics that came out of the high school survey, that's not something that can be addressed uh, uh, immediately, is obviously whenever, specifically to our high school, whenever you talk about the high school, the, the number one piece of feedback that you get is about the start time of the high school and how early it is. Um, the challenge with reviewing the high school start time is that it has significant effect across the entire school district. Um, we have a three-tier busing system where the high schools bus first, then the middle school K-1 level, then the 2-5 level. So any sort of adjustments on, on the start time of the high school would have an impact K-12 across the school district, which is something that we um, need to dig into deeper into the future. Um, so in terms of modifications, there's not any uh, significant modifications there that are, that are happening for the 23-24 school year. I have questions, a, questions about yep, that. Sure. So, out of the 2,300 students in the high school, only 743 took the survey. Correct. And it's my understanding that the survey also went to graduating seniors. Is that accurate? The survey went to current 9 through 12 students. Yes. Right. Students, yes. This, okay. yes. It, it, the survey was, was, I think it was in December when they sent it out. Current 9th grade through 12th graders. Okay. Correct. Um, so based on this feedback, is there looking to be a change? Because there's a lot of conversation about that. About what? Parents, about changing, going to a block schedule, 90 minute schedule, waterfall schedule. I've heard yeah, you name th that, it. That, none of those changes are happening for the 23-24 school year. Okay. None of that. Um, the, Next goal was the development of a summer program for students considering accelerated classes. Um, so the accelerated classes that we offer in Monterey Woodbury are the um, algebra math class at the middle level as well as the biology uh, course at the middle level. The difference between algebra and biology is that, um, I'm going to speak more about open enrollment in a moment, but algebra currently is open enrollment. Biology is not fully open enrollment because biology has staffing implications. We're only able to offer a certain number of sections of biology because of the lab that's also attached to it. So biology is not, uh, is not a full open enrollment. However, algebra at the middle level is. Um, and part of the, the rationale behind offering uh, a summer program for students that are considering that acceleration is that um, you may have students who want to rise to that challenge but may not necessarily feel that they have the, the, um, the strength academically in order to be able to do that. So the plan is if a student is considering to, to take advantage of that open enrollment opportunity in getting a high school course credit, in eighth grade, we're offering a, a preparatory program over the summer for students. Uh, the program is going to be a four-week program. It's going to have two sessions per week for a total of eight sessions. The sessions are going to be 90 minutes. Um, beyond that, we're, and I was hesitant to use the term asynchronous because that brings me back to some of the, 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 COVID, the, the COVID language, but we, um, we're going to establish a Google Classroom where any student who's interested in algebra can join that Google Classroom. So beyond having just the live review and, and um, preparatory material during the course, the teacher's also going to be able to post things in Google Classroom so that students who may not be able to come to all of the various sessions will still have access to some of that review material in order to be able to support them um, in taking that. So the, the program will be twofold. It will be uh, eight 90 minute in-person sessions as well as uh, uh, review materials that will be posted online in order for them to be able to access and do practice independently themselves. Will the people that actually were able to get into class also be able to watch online or no? Um, it's not going to be it's not going to be live streamed. No, okay. it's going to be live in person. But the materials that the teachers are going to be working on that have that they've put together will also be accessible for kids to be able to do independently separately on the computer.
So the people that are actually in the class have to be in person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the live instruction will be in, it will be in person. Correct. Yep. Thank you. So finally, uh, along with that conversation was the the goal to review open enrollment data. So as I shared, the the algebra program at the middle school is a full open enrollment accelerated opportunity for students. Uh, it started in um, uh, three years ago where the current ninth grade class had the ability to open and openly enroll from sixth grade math into seventh grade accelerated math which is the trajectory that then brings students into algebra the class of 2026 the current ninth graders 183 it, at that time when they were in sixth grade going into seventh grade there were 627 students 183 of them chose to go into accelerated math seven which is about 29 percent from accelerated math seven into algebra we had 39 students drop which is a drop rate of 21 percent moving into the class of 2027 which is our current eighth grade students uh, I, I should note the class of 2026 we had 100 percent passing rate on the regents exam that year for those students the class of 2027 our current eighth graders they have not taken the um the regents exam yet but that cohort is 559 students 146 of them chose to go into accelerated math seven for uh, uh, approximately 26 percent of the students that took advantage of that opportunity from seventh grade to eighth grade 28 of them dropped which is a 19 percent dropping rate um, our current seventh grade class which is the class of 2028 529 kids 139 of them uh, chose to go into accelerated math seven as of right now 17 of them have dropped algebra which is a, a drop rate of 12 percent but we don't know for sure <clears throat> until the next school year starts how many students ultimately are going to decide not to go into algebra um, again going back to the previous goal one of the goals is to try to equip kids we don't want kids to go into accelerated math seven have difficulty and then drop out without giving them some degree of support so part of the rationale behind developing that summer program is to hopefully reduce that drop rate for students that decide to openly enroll into accelerated math seven equip them equip them with the skills to be successful and hopefully have them stay in algebra in eighth grade and do well again the benefit of that is because that algebra course is true acceleration where they get that <coughs> high school credit at the end of the year which could open up an opportunity for them to take an additional elective when they go up into the high school I, I have one more sure. I don't know that it's a question and it's it's more for the board than it although you are aware of it too dr. Hassler but um, Dawn and I attended a curriculum webinar I actually looked it up to see how long ago it was it was back in I believe February of 2022 where we kind of discovered that there are several school districts more than several in New York State that have board members sitting on the curriculum reviews mm -hmm. um, I still have all those documents in there I know that I sent it to you and I sent it to mrs. Rodriguez and I think we had hoped to possibly discuss it in a board of ed working session at mm -hmm. some point and it just hasn't happened but I'd like to put that request on the table because I think I know Anthony had some questions this evening about it and it's come up quite a bit and we're kind of in the minority for that as far as a New York State school district that not only do we not have one representative but many of these school districts have two and three board members that kind of sit in as a liaison to at least listen and learn the process it's not as if we're voting on the curriculum I know I'm not a teacher I have no desire to do that but it's just to kind of understand the process of what goes into the curriculum building um, so I definitely like to add that over the summer or a future meeting that we can start to look into going back to that practice because it's my understanding that Monroe Woodbury used to have it and for whatever reason it dissolved can I can I speak to that so we used to have something called um, curriculum reviews mm -hmm. and so we would do them over a period of time it would be every five years um, and board members did sit on them because I remember actually Daryl's in the audience he might remember that Daryl and I were both on the homework review committee <laughs> and yes there was a board there's always a board member sitting on that I think the difference now is that the curriculum is changing much quicker it used to be every five years you take a look at math and but now we've seen a, a very rapid change of curriculum but we can still have committees I think I think that's what you're referring to mm -hmm. we can we can have committees where we review curriculum that may not change that quickly and have and go back to that 
because I think that's how board members would be apprised of what was going on and what the process in, entailed. But yes, that's correct. We used to have that. <coughs> and I think even even for the ones that are changing quickly, I mean, that's those are the questions that we get. And you know, I only know. I mean, we've whenever we've had a question, you're more than willing to send us literal handouts from curriculum. I mean, we've all gotten that when we've asked. But aside from my knowing what my children are doing, or I hear from other parents, I, I couldn't tell you what's being taught in the AP history class. And I'm not saying that we need to have every single detail of every single course, because my goodness, that's a lot. But I just think the generic <laughs> overview, so that we would be able to answer questions that were asked, you know, from the community, and just to have a better understanding <coughs> of, like I said, the textbooks, how do we, you know, to Jeff's point earlier about the electives, you know, that gets brought on, I think, a lot by our students. What is the student interest? You know, what do they want to learn about? Um, and I didn't know that until I learned about that as a board member. So, so we can right. We can talk about the. Then maybe it's not the curriculum reviews because the curriculum re reviews were a whole year long. Um, it it started in October, and I think we would go through the entire year. And then at the end of a curriculum review, the committee would have a recommendation to the board of education to say, "Here is what we're doing, and here are our recommendations." So I don't think that that's specifically what you're talking about, but we can discuss that yeah. further to say how how do we apprise or have the you know teachers and, and, and a, a parent right. or a, a board member on a committee, and what would that committee what would be the pers purpose of the committee? And I agree. Yeah. I think that should be a discussion amongst us because, and I mean, I'll speak for myself now. I don't want that. Like I have zero desire to attend the ten meetings at Pine Tree to pick a new book. But I think it's important that if we had one representative that went every fall and every spring and we heard what it was that was being decided and then we could report back, that's, I think, it's more of an overview. I don't think that, at least, again, not for me, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I'm not looking to attend every single curriculum meeting or curriculum review that's occurring. It would be great. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I, I defer to the professionals doing it. I think it's just getting that information would be a lot more valuable. Well, I'll, I'm going to be scheduling a working session when the new um, board member comes on in July. So it'll be either later in July or early August. We'll schedule something, and that can be one of the topics that come up. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Kravitz and Dr. Hessler. Did anyone bring their pillow with them tonight? Should have. Okay. Next up, we are at personnel. Ms. Hawk? I respectfully request approval for the items listed under personnel. Are there any questions? We have a motion? Motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Business and financial, Mr. Cahill? Thank you. Uh, I also respectfully request the approval of the business and financial items. 14.1 to 14.2. Any questions? Motion? Motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Committees on special education and preschool special education may have a motion. Motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 American Rescue Plan Act. <clears throat> yes, uh, so we wanted to announce that the uh, district is seeking <clears throat> input from the public and stakeholders related to the American Rescue Plan Act grant. If you recall, there were three grants associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. There was the CARES Act, CARISA <coughs> Act of 2000, 2021, <laughs> and finally the American Rescue Plan Act, which was the largest in the, in the third. So that's the one we're seeking input on, similar to what we're, we were doing with foundation aid, the increase in foundation aid. So we've, um, we've put some uh, materials on our website, uh, including a very brief survey. So anyone that's interested in weighing in on uh, how this American Rescue Plan Act funding would be used can, can do that. Um, I just have a question on that. With the <coughs> debt ceiling deal that just got passed, there was some talk about removing non-committed COVID funds. Yes. Are we sure that this is not part of that? My understanding is that it is not, that there, okay. there was American Rescue Plan Act funding for many municipal entities and um, in, in various ways, and that this is not uh, the 
type of appropriation that they were talking about clawing back? Because it was in flight already. There were other things being done. Yeah, right. because that was my understanding as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Last up, we have uh, adjournment into executive session for purposes of discussing safety and security on a personal matter. May I have a motion? Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.